chapter 6. An email that I got from Kathy Tron a week or so ago got me thinking about Passover. She mentioned that uh, Cattlemen's down in Folsom area, uh, we tentatively have that room scheduled for a night to be much observed again this year for those of you who want to get, to get together as a group. Uh, most of you know where it's at. I've never been there, but uh, I'm sure it's easy to find. <laughs> and they're going to hold by the prices and stuff like this that they've been doing with us over the last several years and not charging us for corkage if we want to bring our own wine and that sort of thing as well. But I noticed, I looked at the calendar, and I realized that the Passover is not until the 13th of April this year. It's pretty late. So we're about a little less than three months away. But that being said, uh, the sermon that I prepared is probably going to be like a little precursor to the Passover season. Uh, we're asking all of our speakers to now start thinking about Passover and start having some messages that are more in line with helping us to prepare for the Passover evening, uh, which will be again April 13th. I think all of us know that God is a God of love. Uh, God talks about love a lot. Christ and God both talk and show us that we need to have love toward each other. And there, the Bible is just laced with the concept of building a loving relationship with God, with Jesus Christ, and with each other, and with the world as far as that's concerned. There is, however, another side to God. Uh, and I think it's a side that is important for us to understand, uh, especially prior to the Passover season. Here in Proverbs chapter 6, I want to take a look at what Solomon, king, son of the king of David, had to say about this subject that I'm talking about. We've discussed many aspects of the wisdom of Solomon over the last couple of sermons that I've given. But this passage in Proverbs 6 actually discusses several issues of life. Now, I've never realized it before I prepared this sermon this last week or so, but Solomon, when he's talking in Proverbs 6, starts with a subject that seems somewhat innocuous, but then as you read through the chapter, you realize that he's talking about this somewhat innocuous behavior, starts to develop an attitude, starts to develop a way of thinking, a way of believing, and a way of responding and acting in life that in fact leads to less desirable behavior, less desirable actions, less desirable attitudes, which then, if they're not curtailed, start leading into even more destructive behavior and attitudes. But let's begin here and take a look and see what in this we feel we personally might need to pay some attention to. Proverbs 6, verse 1. He starts out with, My son, if you become surety for your friend, if you have shaken hands in pledge for a stranger, you then become snared by the words of your mouth, you are taken by the words of your mouth. In other words, if we have gone into a guarantee or a relationship, or we've co-signed on a loan, or we've made a loan to somebody, or we've borrowed money from somebody, whatever it is that we've done in this relationship where we've entangled ourselves with another human being, we need to pay attention to this. Uh, the practice of borrowing back in those days was pretty much frowned and condemned, frowned upon and condemned, unless it was an emergency. Because when you get into this behavior and this mindset, and this is what he starts with, he says, if you get into this mindset, that if you want something as opposed to need something, you go into debt. You borrow from somebody. I need, I want a new cow, but I don't have the money to go buy a new cow. Can you loan me $500 so I can go buy my new cow? You say, yeah, I can loan you the $500. That's going to be $500. You can pay me 5% interest or 10% interest or whatever you decide you have. So now I'm obligated to you because you loaned me money. What if my cow dies? And I take it home. And that's stuff like that's happened. You borrow money to go buy something, and then the thing that you buy either disappears, gets smashed, gets destroyed, or dies. Now you're still obligated for the $500, but you still want your cow. So maybe you go borrow another $500 to get another cow. Now you owe $1,000. The point that Solomon is trying to make, this kind of negotiating interrelationship behavior is actually a problematic thing because it gets you into a line of thinking where you start feeling like 
I can get whatever I need. Somebody else can always help me. I don't have to have the money. I may not even have to have the money to pay it back. Lending was a means back then to help in a true time of need. Okay? Not for wants. Like so many Americans have today gotten into financial trouble with. Credit card debt's at an all-time high. Almost every third or fourth ad you see on television or listen to on the radio is about bankruptcy attorneys. Now, I understand that sometimes we get situations going where we just, that we have no, we know of no way to control it, but for the most part, most Americans have gotten themselves into debt because they want, want, want. They want more. They want bigger. They want nicer. They want prettier. They want more formal. They want whatever. Most Americans, if they only bought what they actually needed, would probably not be in debt. So this is the point that Solomon is trying to make in these first couple of verses here. Anyone getting entangled in this is what Solomon is advising against. Go to verse 3 now. He said, so do this. So he's telling his son, if you've gotten into this kind of a relationship with somebody, deliver yourself. In other words, get out of it. For you have come into the hand of your friend. Your friend owns you, whether you like it or not. They control you. They can actually stop you from doing things sometimes, especially if you buy, borrow from a bank. And you try to borrow from somebody else, the bank says, no, you can't borrow from them. You, you owe us. You can't do something like that again. He said, go and humble yourself. In other words, eat crow. Go back to the person that you've gotten into this entanglement with and plead to get out of it. Ask if there's a way that I can negate this. My obligation to you. I said I was going to take care of your kids if you ever die or something. Said, I mean, I, I'm signed a document that I, 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 can't, I can't make that commitment. I, I don't have the wherewithal to even take care of myself. Whatever it is that you've gotten in this relationship with this other person. But then listen to how he says, get out of it. He doesn't mean just get out of it if you can. He said, give no sleep to your eyes nor slumber to your eyelids. In other words, don't let it just drag on. You need to do something about this now. Because the relationship concept, this way of thinking concept that you've gotten yourself entangled in, starts to lead to something that's more destructive. And we're going to see what he's talking about here. He says, deliver yourself like a gazelle from the hand of the hunter. Now, all of us have probably watched these nature stories on television, right? Maybe National Geographic and stuff, like that, where they show these stories in the Serengeti and they show lions hunting down gazelles or, you know, uh, tigers or leopards or z uh, whatever it is, hunting another animal. And when you see the gazelles know that they're being chased down by this other animal or a man with a gun or whatever, the gazelle doesn't just look at them and flick his ears and flick his tail and take another nibble of grass and just sort of hang loose while the attacker's coming, do they? No, the second they sense this, they turn tail and bolt out of there. That's where you see them leaping away, trying to get away as quickly as they can, as fast as they can. Solomon's telling his son here, if you get into these kinds of integrated relationships with other people because of Com uh, commitments that you've made and obligations that you've created, you need to get out of it. Deliver yourself like a gazelle from the hand of the, the hunter and like a bird from the hand of the fowler. It's not something to be taken lightly. Yet we, as Americans, for the most part, consider debt part of life. I mean, it's amazing how many people have multiple credit cards and every single one of them is maxed out paying the minimum payment. And they even, notice, they, they even notify you on your credit cards now, if you pay the minimum payment, it's going to take you 90 years. I'm exaggerating for purposes. And it's going to cost you 10 times as much. But if you want to make the minimum payment, we're fine with that because we're making money on you. We own you. Similar to making a vow that you really have no business making or capable of fulfilling sometimes. Solomon says, do what you can to get out of this snare. This is like a trap. 
It's a trap of life. It's an approach to life that is not something healthy to stay in. It's like an animal being trapped by a hunter. And maybe even willing to gnaw its own leg off to get out of the trap. Then he changes direction just a bit. But what he's doing, I believe, and this is some of the things that was just an aha sensation for me, showing us how to avoid this borrowing and going into debt kind of relationship by taking a different frame of mind. Verse 6, he says, go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise. So he's saying, you can learn a lesson from an insect. <laughs> he says, these insects, these ants, have no captains, they have no overseers or rulers, provides her supplies in the summers and gathers her food in the harvest, pointing out that we can be lulled into thinking we will be provided for even if we don't make the effort to provide for ourselves. He's suggesting, I believe here, that if we go into that first kind of behavior that he's saying, get out of, it starts developing into another attitude and another behavior that gets us to start thinking, hey, you know, if I don't make it, somebody will bail me out. Mom and dad will help me. Grandpa will help me. My neighbors will help me. I can borrow money from so-and-so. I can get the, somebody's going to make sure that I don't starve, even though I'm not making any effort to put, provide for myself or my family. We can't, as he's trying to point out here, we can't get away with being lazy. Being lazy starts to develop into a whole new attitude. And he's showing a progression here, I believe. Verse 9, he said, How long will you slumber, O sluggard? When will you rise from your sleep? When are you going to wake up? You have allowed yourself to get into a frame of mind and a way of thinking, and it's so common to you, it's so natural for you, that you're okay with it now. This is the way you are. This is who you are. And you're okay with that. In verse 11, oh no, verse 10, he said, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. It's like, you make up every excuse about why you don't need to change. Why you can just keep going around doing the same thing. Because everybody, I've, I've always been bailed out. Sounds like the government. It always turns around. It always makes a shift. We always get bailed out. We always get rain. It's never not happened. It's a frame of mind. It's an attitude and approach that he's saying it's a dangerous frame of mind to get into. He said that all, he's in a point out, he said, so shall your poverty come upon you like a prowler. He said all of a sudden you're going to wake up one day and it's going to be like somebody pounced on you and you don't have anything. <laughs> you don't have any money. You don't own your home. You don't own your car. You're losing stuff. Creditors are knocking at the door and you need like and your need like an armed man. You have needs and now you can't provide for your own needs because you allowed yourself to be lulled into this attitude and this frame of mind. Taking life easy and not doing what can be done to provide for you and your family is not an acceptable way of life before God. Resting on our laurels and not pushing to be always more productive is not acceptable to God. Because God doesn't want us just to get to the point of being able to provide for ourselves. I mean, elsewhere in the Bible, he talks about making sure that you've got enough that you can help somebody in need. So when you have a clothing drive, you can go clean out your closet, pack up stuff, and you have the need for finances to get there. You can make a donation, and you can start doing stuff to help other people. We just lived that. Plan for the future. Don't let the future control you. And sometimes we refuse to go there because we don't like what we see. So we just keep doing the same old stuff we've always been doing. We keep getting lulled into this more lackadaisical approach to life. Then Solomon points out how this leads to even a more destructive life. Verse 12. He said, eventually what can happen is you start developing into a worthless person a wicked man walks with a perverse mouth, he winks with his eyes, he shuffles with his feet, and he points with his fingers. 
yeah, I know what I'm doing. I, I can handle this. She can't. Now, I know her. She's, she's a mess. He can't take care of this. He's not, but if, he, if he'd start acting like me, he'd be a lot better off. And these people start developing this attitude. They know it all. And they're in poverty. He said they could be in poverty physically, morally, spiritually. It can be in multiple ways. And I think all of us have seen and know people like this. People that just sort of mock at life sometimes. Someone who's always got an opinion about someone else. An individual who's always ready to point the finger and judge others. But never really looking at his self or herself. See, that's not what God wants. God wants us to be looking at us and saying, what can I do differently? What can I do to improve me? What can I do to improve not just my situation, but what can I do to improve my situation so I can actually be a benefit to others? See, that's a different mindset, a completely different mindset from one over the other. And then he goes on and he says, what does a person like this create for themselves and for other people when they start developing into this mentality? He said in verse 14, he said, perversity is in their heart. He devises evil continuously. He sows discord. This is talking about a person who's got way too much time on their hands. And they're not doing something productive with their time. I mean, we've got people in the church that I know of who have a lot of time on their hands, but man, they're doing stuff with it. They're helping other people. They're going behind the scenes and doing things for other people. And that's what God wants us to be doing. When we've got excess time on our hands, don't become the sluggards. Don't become the lazy ones. Don't become the individuals that are thinking, I'm entitled. <laughs> the world, life owes me. It doesn't, that's not the way life works. And normally, as we're going to see, if we allow this to just keep developing, keep going on, it develops into other behaviors and other attitudes. And where does Solomon say all this is going to lead? Verse 15 of Proverbs 6. Therefore his, this individual's calamity, shall come suddenly. Suddenly he shall be broken without remedy. Their life will be a mess. Remember the Peanuts cartoon? A lot of people were real fans of that. Charlie Brown said this once in a Peanuts cartoon. He said, sometimes I lie awake at night and I ask, where have I gone wrong? Then a voice says to me, this is going to take a lot more than one night. <laughs> See, we don't get into a situation like that quickly. It develops over time. And how many times have you ever heard somebody say, well, how can this happen to me? Why is this happening to me? How come, I'm, how come I, I'm, I'm all messed up? How come I'm like this? Well, if we live life and adopt some of these attitudes that Solomon's telling us to stay away from, we develop into a way of thinking and a way of behavior and a way of acting that will eventually fall. And it'll involve suffering, and it'll involve difficulties in our lives that we have probably brought upon ourselves. We'll go on there and ask all the time, why me? How can this kind of thing keep happening to me and my family? But then let's notice where Solomon goes next in his dialogue. And I find it interesting that what we're going to read next, and we've read this several times, we've been in the church and in sermons and sermonettes, we know that God's a God of love, but God is also a God of hate. Certain things in life God hates. So much so that he lists them here in the Bible. It comes on the heels, which I find interesting, of a person who has allowed themselves to live a life that is a less than desirable way of life. And I believe what he's saying is, these kinds of things that God hates is what that can act actually develop into. What does he say? These six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination. In other words, the seventh one he, he despises. 
Then we can read what God hates. I would suggest attitudes that we're looking at here is something we should stay as far away from as possible. Verse 17. God hates a proud look. God hates a lying tongue. God hates hands that shed innocent blood. God hates a heart that devises wicked plans. God hates feet that are swift in running toward evil. God hates a false witness who speaks lies. And the thing that God absolutely detests is one who sows discord among the brethren. That's a mouthful, isn't it? But God says these seven things I hate. I, I, I can't even stand being around them. Did you notice that God inspired this to follow the preceding discussion of Solomon's? So I think historically, we have taken each one of those little vignettes out of context. And there's a message there too, as we heard in the sermonette. You can take it out of context, and there's a message. You can look at it in context, and there's a different message. And I know that historically we've taken Proverbs 16, 17, and 18, or verse 6, chapter 6, 17, 18, and 19, out of context. And they still are powerful. Because it talks about things that God hates. But God says he hates this because this is a result of what we were talking about a little bit earlier. It's a deterioration of behavior. He points out that getting ourselves in debt, being a slacker, just being lazy in life, is a person that starts developing an attitude of entitlement. One where they always are looking at challenges in their life and they can't figure it out, and wanting others to bail them out. Then God points out that this type of lifestyle leads to behaving in a way that God hates. Now, I don't know about you, but the last thing I want to have said about me is what you're doing, Joe, God hates. Wouldn't that make you sick if somebody said, I hate what you're doing? I hate how you're handling that? Let's look at this proud look. What does this mean? This literally means haughty or lofty eyes and pride. Turn over a couple pages to Proverbs 16. A proud look is probably the idea that we believe we're pretty good. We've got it together. We, matter of fact, we're not probably good. We're probably better than most people. Smarter, more intelligent, more developed, more educated, more capable. And when we think like that, we actually start believing we are better people. Other translations in the Bible bring a little more understanding to this passage of uh, a proud look. One has a haughty appearance. Another one is an arrogant look. Another one is full of pride. Let's look at Proverbs 16 and verse 18. Only one verse. Solomon again writes here, he says, Pride goes before destruction. Pride is something that can kill us. And I'm not sure if we've ever really thought about it that way before. To think that pride could actually kill you and kill people around you. It's that destructive. And a haughty spirit before a fall. That one passage where Paul said, take heed who thinks he stands lest he fall. It could cost us our life and others. Let me share an illustration with you on this concept from the Encyclopedia of 7,700 illustrations about life. In a certain pond, there were two ducks and a frog who were neighbors and best friends. They played together all day long during the summertime. But as the cold drew near, the water dried up and the ducks realized they had to move. This is the ducks that live behind my house over here. This would be easy for the ducks, because all they'd have to do is make wing and fly to a new pond. But what about their friend the frog? It's not so easy for him to go find another pond. Finally, it was decided that they would put an end of a stick in the bill of each duck, and then ask the frog to hang onto the stick with his mouth, and then they would fly him to another pond. And so they did. 
and it was working great. Just then, a farmer looked up and said to his wife, What a great idea! I wonder who thought of that? And the frog said, I did! As he let go of the stick. <laughs> to speak. Thus illustrating, pride goes before the fall. The problem with a person who thinks that he or she is always correct or more intelligent than others is that they develop this attitude that there's no room for improvement. I'm already good. Matter of fact, I'm pretty good. No, I'm really good. Matter of fact, I'm probably better than most. Matter of fact, I probably am better than most. Matter of fact, I know I'm better than most. Just ask me. I believe God listed this first sin, pride, and that proud look at the top of the list because it's the root of the majority of our sins in life. What's the next thing he talked about? He said also a lying tongue is something that God hates. God said he hates this type of behavior. Let's go to Revelation chapter 21. Revelation 21, all the way to the back of the book, the second to the last chapter of the Bible. congregation. He said, next week I plan to preach about the sin of lying. To help you understand my sermon, I want you all to read Mark 17 before the sermon next week. The following Sabbath, as he prepared to deliver his sermon, the minister asked for a show of hands. He wanted to know how many of you read Mark 17, and every hand went up in the room. The minister smiled and said, Mark only has 16 chapters. So now I will proceed with my sermon about lying. On that note, let's read Revelation 21 and verse 7. Revelation 21, verse 7. This is a translation that John took from Christ, from God. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Profound statement of life about our future. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. You ain't going to make it. It's not going to happen. God said, lying, is, you're not going to make it. You have no part of God's plan. Some think, however, that they can get away with this sort of behavior because it's just a little lies. They're not being, it's just a little white lies. It's interesting how people will justify with lying and think nothing of it. All of us have done it. Every single person sitting in this room has done this. Clearly, any form of misrepresentation or lying is something that God said he hates. The next thing he said was, hands that shed innocent blood. Let's go to Psalms 127. Psalm 127. Psalm 127. I'm sure it's not all that Solomon was referring to, but today we have the more obvious issues like abortion, infant abandonment in dumpsters, infant abandonment in trash cans, or just dumping babies anywhere. It's so, it got to be so bad in the state of California that we actually passed a law because of the abuse of the innocent children, the abuse of innocent infants. California passed a law stating that you or anybody wants you can take a baby or something, something you're going to abandon, one of, the, one of the children, and you can take it to any hospital, hand it over, no questions asked, you will not be prosecuted. That's 
how extensive it has become. It is so commonplace almost that we created a law for it to accommodate that kind of behavior. Extermination of innocent lives. Shedding of innocent blood is a horror in today's society. We even have parents killing their own children. Mothers drowning them, burying them, shooting them, burning them, torturing them. Students killing other students. We just had one or two more last week. And killing other people. This is a tragedy on mankind's shoulders that God is not going to be very gentle about when he finally sorts it all out. We mock, we have mocked ancient practices of child sacrifice that are listed in the Bible and torture. You know, we're no better in society today than they were back then. The concept is supported by the psalmist, which happens to be Solomon again here in Psalm 127. Here he specifically addresses a baby in the womb. This is something very special and very precious to God. An innocent one, if there ever was an innocent child or innocent being. Psalm 27, 127, verse 3. Psalm 127, verse 3. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. It's a blessing from God. You know, there's a bit more to this, though. I think it's something, again, we should pay attention to. Let's turn to 1 John 3. 1 John chapter 3, all the way to the other end of the book again. Shedding innocent blood can take on another behavior. And many times we as Christians have unfortunately got involved with this. Sometimes inadvertently, sometimes cognitively. It's not just an act of taking an innocent life literally, so we excuse ourselves. And we don't think of it as committing the sin that God said he hates. There's much more to this statement as we're going to find out here from John. Let's look at 1 John 3, verse 14. 1 John 3, 14. We know that we have passed from life to death. From death to life, I'm sorry. From death to life. Because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Clearly, another form of shedding innocent blood is developing a nasty attitude toward another human being. God says, if you hate your brother, you have killed your brother. And you are guilty of shedding innocent blood. What's the next thing God said he hates? He said he hates a heart that devises wicked plans. Let's turn to Matthew 15. Matthew 15. God tells us many times in the Bible, that we have a pretty wicked and deceitful heart and mind. I'm not going there, but one that is an absolute confirmation of this is Jeremiah 17, verse 9. Put it in your notes if you want. Jeremiah 17, 9. It is expected, though, by God and Jesus Christ, that we, through the help of God's Holy Spirit, keep this deceitful mind and wicked mind under control. As I mentioned in Reno this morning, having evil thoughts, having wicked thoughts, having thoughts of sexuality, having thoughts of whatever you want to have thoughts about that aren't godly, are not even by themselves sin. Yet I, I do know that some of us over the years have absolutely massacred ourselves because we have these thoughts. The thoughts are not sin. The thoughts are part of being a human being, being influenced in a world controlled by Satan. It's what we do with the thoughts that has everything to do with how God looks at us in dealing with them. It's a function of being aware constantly of where our mind and our heart is going. 
You all know what I'm talking about. I mean, something happens and this thought comes into your mind and you know it's a wrong thought. What do you do next is the important side of that. It actually involves the way we think about and in our everyday lives. As you've been hearing me say and others say for the last two or three years, being a Christian is a 24-7 responsibility and job. You cannot not be conscious of it and make it work. The mind, the heart, and the world we live in won't let it happen. We're constantly going through these battles. Christ points this out in the beginning of Matthew 15, verse 16. Matthew first, uh, 15, verse 16. So Jesus said, are you also still without understanding? He's talking about another issue. Do you not understand that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then is eliminated? It goes in, it comes out, and everything's cool. But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart. And that's what defiles a man. For out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. He said, you know what? All of this kind of stuff is brewing in you because you're a human being. You're a human being that has human nature that has been negatively influenced by Satan for 6,000 plus years. And it has taken its toll. One of the most dangerous positions I believe a Christian can be in is thinking that doesn't happen to me. There are evil thoughts in the hearts of all men, but the devising and fabricating of them with a preoccupation that yields control to Satan is what is abhorrent to God. See, having those evil thoughts, again, is not sin. God knows they're there. We just read that it's there. And he said in verse 20, he said, These are the things which defile a man when they take these thoughts and run with it. But to eat with unwashed hands, that doesn't defile a person. It's what's developed in the heart, developed in the mind, and then what comes out of the mouth. That's what kills people. You know, to bury something doesn't mean that it's dead. It may simply mean that we've buried something alive, like a cancer, that will devour and destroy us from within. It's there. You all know where you came from. You know the sins that you had to repent of before you were baptized, if you're baptized. You know what kind of a thought pattern and thought process you used to have as a human being? It never left. Yes, we buried it at baptism, but it, the, 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 the latency is still there. That's why every once in a while you can be in prayer to God and you get this negative, nasty, evil thought come into your mind. It's because of the way you're a human being. And unless we're constantly controlling this with the power of God's Spirit, it's going to keep cropping its ugly head up. What we allow our hearts to devise, or what is nurtured in our hearts, is what actually dictates our behavior. The next point that God said that he hates is feet that are swift and running to evil. Isaiah 59. Go to Isaiah 59. Now this might be interpreted by some as being one thing, but I'm, hopefully we will see that it's actually a multiple of things that this can be. It speaks of feet that are quickly ready to try and carry out what has already been devised in the heart of either themselves or somebody else. This is more than falling or sliding into sin, which is common to all of us. This is more the execution of a premeditated act of causing harm or hurt to come to another human being. It typically comes from hanging around the wrong person or wrong crowd. All of us 
have been involved in situations at work, at school, with friends, with family, and all of a sudden the conversation starts to deteriorate. The approach to things starts to deteriorate. You give it a bunch of guys and eventually sex is going to come up. Probably the same true with women, I don't know. But you know when it goes there. We instinctively know this. And once we've got God's Spirit, we, I mean, we're really fine-tuned to this. How do we handle that? Do we like it because we're not actually doing it but we love listening to it? That's actually feet running the evil. <laughs> we know things when they're getting questionable, borderline, and dicey. To go there is a huge sin. Let's look at Isaiah 59, verse 7. Isaiah 59, verse 7. Their feet run to evil, and they make haste to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity, wasting and destruction are in their paths. The way of peace they have not known. There is no justice in their ways. They have made themselves crooked paths. Whoever takes that way shall not know peace. Stay as far away from people like that as you possibly can. What's another form of this? We must understand this also includes the desire to hear about what I heard about one of you and your nasty behavior. All of a sudden the ears perk up, don't they? I wonder who it is. I want to know who it is. I want to know what it is. We're all like that. Instinctively, we're like that. It's a piece of gossip. It's a piece of dirt about somebody else. We can't wait to hear it. And that's what keeps gossip going. A willing ear to hear. That's another form of running to evil, brethren. And we've got to stay away from stuff like this. Turning our attention to anything that takes away from that sincerity and truth that Paul talked about during the days of unleavened bread. Remember he said, the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. That's where our hearts need to go. As well as developing get your, itching ears for dirt and spiritual diversion. I mean, the, you name it, and it's out there. We're almost finished. The next point that God said he hates is a false witness who speaks lies. This literally is translated, he that breathes out or utters a false witness. Turn to Matthew 26. In Matthew 26, false witness. Is a false witness something that is a lie about somebody else? Think about it before you answer. Is a false witness a lie that you speak about somebody else? It could be. I'm going to show you by Jesus Christ's own words. You can bear false witness by telling the truth. Repeating something in such a way as it brings harm to another person is false witness. Let's look at Jesus Christ as the example. Matthew 26. And keep in mind, bearing false witness is part of the Ten Commandments. It's a part of that. So it's like a form of perjury. We're trying to destroy people's lives. This could be speaking about someone from a position of thinking they know what's going on, but they really don't. It could be a second-hand, third-hand. If you get second-hand information, third-hand information, and you repeat it, you're giving false witness. Whether it's good, bad, or indifferent. A friend of mine, years ago, decades ago, was out with a bunch of guys. And they took a long road trip. And they stopped at a pub and they had some fun and they were telling stories and telling jokes and drinking beers and, and just being crazy. And they were videotaping it and taking pictures of it. Just like a half a dozen of them. And they were all being a little crazy in their late teens, early twenties. Fifty years later, one of the persons in that group finds this video and decides to launch it on YouTube or Facebook and include everybody's name who's involved in this. 
individual that I know said, you know what? I'm appalled that somebody's doing this without my permission. I'm not that person that's in that video anymore. I worked hard. God worked hard to take me from that to what I am today. And it will hurt me if somebody else starts looking at all this crap thinking, that's still me. That's bearing false witness, brethren. It's true, but it's hurtful. Let's look at another true but hurtful. This happened to Jesus Christ. Matthew 26, verse 59. Now the chief priests, the elders, and all the council sought false testimony against Jesus so they could put him to death. They needed some kind of a, a fall guy kind of thing. But none were found. Even though many false witnesses came forward, they found none that were substantial enough that we could kill him. But at last, two false witnesses came forward and said this. And we can read it. Verse 61, this fellow, Jesus Christ, said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. Did Jesus Christ say that? Yes, he did. It is absolute truth. But the context in which it is present, pre presented and not understanding what Jesus Christ was meaning prophetically, it made him sound like a blasphemer. That's all they needed to put him to death. See how damaging false witness can be, even with what you're repeating being true. These are words for all of us to take to heart. We need to learn to keep our noses out of other people's business. This is one of those areas of greatest offense in bearing false witness. Lastly, the thing that God said he hates most. It is stated as an abomination to him, which means he is disgusted by it. One who sows discord among the brethren. Turn to James 3. James 3. You know, this sowing discord comes in so many different forms and shapes, and a lot of us have experienced it over the years. It can include, but it is definitely not limited to some things like this. Challenging authority. Openly challenging authority. That's, that's a form of strong discord. Introducing, quote unquote, new truth. Gossiping about others. Complaining about anyone, anything, maybe everything. Inappropriate relationships and behavior, adultery, fornication, pornography, you, you name it. Lying, cheating, stealing, judging, deceiving, slandering, being contentious, or just plain mocking and bashing. All of those are forms of sowing discord among the brethren because they make the brethren uneasy. God said he's disgusted by that. Here in James, James will show us how this all comes about, the controlling and not, or not controlling, a one little organ in the body. If you will notice, all of the others that we talked about, all the other things that God said he hates are summed up in this last point of sowing, sowing discord, which is probably why God detests it. It's hard enough to be a Christian without someone else making it more difficult for you in your life. James 3, verse 1. My brethren, not many of you become teachers. Let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, also, and able also to bridle the whole body. I don't know anybody like that. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. We just take a 2,000 pound animal, and make it go wherever we want to do, do whatever we want it to do. We look at ships, although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot decides to spin that wheel, that ship's going there. Even so, the tongue is a little member. 
and boasts great things. So how great a forest a little fire kindles. The tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of nature. It is set on fire by hell. That's pretty strong words. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. This is how he ends it. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Clearly, we have seen seven things that our loving Father absolutely hates. He hates them for what they do to his children, his people, your brethren. He also expects us to take a stand on what we learn and take a stand to do it differently. He does not want us to be hearers of the word only. Passover is just a little under three months away. I hope all of us will look at what we went over today in Proverbs 6 and see if there's anything that we need to repent of or clean up before we take the Passover this year. Have a great Sabbath.